Okay, cool. So hello everybody. Today I'd like to spend the next 15 minutes introducing you to reverse engineering. So sorry for those 7% uh, who can teach me a thing or two. Please do afterwards, uh, but, but we're, gonna, we're gonna go through some really, really basic stuff here. And uh, for you as developers, Reverse engineering is important because that's one of the things that attackers are going to do to your stuff after you after you push it out there. So we're gonna we're gonna take a look at the whole process. Those of you who have uh, seen or attended my presentations know that I like to uh, mix academic approach with with practical things. So this is this isn't going to be any different. I'm gonna um, talk talk a bunch of history, which I hope is going to be super fun. I had lots of fun preparing that, and. Uh, I'm gonna discuss some of the engineering behind actual compilations and actual uh, process of, of, of compiling a program. Um, now, those of you who work with web apps, and most developers actually do work with web apps. I've, I've been trying to find a non-web developer for the past uh, three months, and, and I, can't, I, I can't find one. So this doesn't really apply to, to web applications, of course. Um, but the classical applications or even, even iOS applications, other applications, um, of course, are, are compiled and, and can be decompiled too. So let's take a look at reverse engineering. This is general principle of, of reverse engineering. We actually took that from indiamart.com, which is, uh, is kind of eBay for services in India. Uh, some, some companies advertising this service, you can actually buy it. You can, you can buy, buy the service take an item and they will reverse engineer it for you and send to production so that you can actually make it. So this is a general, um, general reverse engineering process that applies to, to any, kind of, any kind of things, uh, physical things, software, and so on. But we are going to be, of course, talking about the software today. And uh, the, oh, my slides are all messed up. Let's, let's, look, at, let's look at this slide now. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> the contents. The contents. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna take a look at hardware architecture. How many of you think that they know what hardware architecture is? Like could give a definition. Okay, half. That's good. That's good. Um, and then we're gonna take a look at different different processors. So not different processors, but rather how processors affect um, compilation and decompilation process. Um, short look at engineering, and then. Finally, reverse engineering with a lot of demos and, and a lot of hands-on. So those of you who do not reverse engineer um, daily may, may want to write down some commands. Super simple commands, basic stuff. But if you want to take a look at your own programs and, and take a look at how they, um, how they look compiled and how they look decompiled, that's, that's what you can do afterwards uh, when you get back home. So the previous slide. Uh, hardware architecture. <coughs> Super, super, uh, super academic, super historic stuff, Turing machine. Um, Turing machine is, everyone already knows what it is. Is there anyone who doesn't know what it is? Don't be shy, yeah? Some, some shy people, kind of raising hands, okay. So uh, it's, it's not, um, it, was, um, it was described, uh, it, it, it was described by, by Alan, Alan Turing, um, during the World War, um, it uh, it wasn't it wasn't a physical thing initially, and actually in in this in this specific uh, in this specific description, it could never be a physical thing. Why is that? Those of you who know the definition, yeah. Uh, the tape needs to be infinite. Exactly, yeah. The tape needs to be infinite. But what what are we talking about here? Let's 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 uh, let's uh, go back a bit. So, Turing machine is a theoretical machine that consists of an uh, infinite tape with data. So here we can see um, there are some ones, there are some zeros, the blanks, and there is uh, one or zero being, being written there at the moment. And this machine can scroll through the tape in one direction or the other direction, how, however far along it likes, and read whatever's on the tape, execute instructions, and write on the tape. So what's important about, uh, about the machine here is, yes, as we already discussed, it's, it has infinite tape, so it's really theoretical. But Turing machine is basically the, um, the, the, the measure, the basic measure of a digital or analog, a, a basic measure of a computer being able to execute any program. 
of course, we can't we can't solve the halting problem on Turing machine, but any classical or or, or, or we can't we can't. Uh, uh, run uh, quantum algorithms, right? But any classical program can be executed on this theoretical Turing machine. So it's a measure of, of whether the, a system is, is versatile enough to do arbitrary work for us. Um, if we take a look at, at uh, web, right? I have to put it in somewhere. Um, so if we take a look at web, then for example, uh, JavaScript is of course a Turing machine, uh, which can be easily, easily proven just by the virtue of you're able to run MS-DOS or Windows 98 inside your browser. Um, what, may be, what may be surprising to some of you, CSS3 alone is also a Turing machine. You can just use cascading style sheets as, as a Turing machine. So Turing machine is simply a measure, a measure of, of um, a machine being able to execute any arbitrary, uh, any arbitrary program. Now, if a machine adheres to these uh, principles of a Turing machine, it's called Turing complete. Uh, so ENIAC, uh, back in 19, 1945, this is a more recent photo of, of it, it's missing, uh, it's missing a panel, I think. Um, ENIAC was uh, the first, it wasn't the first real Turing complete machine, but it was the first um, machine that finds real wide use. And it was a general purpose machine. Uh, you could make it do many, many things, many mathematical things. You, can, you, can, you could run a lot of algorithms on there, and it was reprogrammable. Uh, but it had some, some, some problems. Uh, so you had to actually spend some weeks as a drawing board from your algorithm that you have in your head as a programmer, creating flowcharts, <coughs> then taking those flowcharts, and writing down how you're going to rewire all those, you can't see most of the wires there, but all those wires and panels. And, and then you would go and physically rewire the machine. And it would take weeks just to write, just to write, just load in a small program into ENIAC. Of course, it doesn't have a tape, but it does have, it does have memory. It does have memory where the instructions are stored. And why is it important for our reverse engineering uh, small lecture here today? Um, because most of machines nowadays, this laptop here, that laptop there, most of your phones here, um, use a specific architecture that has advanced from ENIAC. Um, it's uh, it was described and later, uh, and later built by uh, von Neumann. So am I, am, I, am I too deep now? How many of you know von Neumann architecture? Okay, good, good, we're on the same page. Still, the same ha half of the people who, who knew the previous term Turing machine also knew von Neumann architecture, great. Great, um, so von Neumann architecture is based around a stored program concept. So instead of actually going around and rewiring all the cables, a program is part of the memory. You just load it digitally. So it's, it's, already, it's already a digital uh, machine. It consists of the central processing unit, uh, which consists of control unit and ar arithmetic logic unit. Um, and uh, these two units, this is a CPU, right? Um, these two units serve different purposes. It is, well, nowadays we have system on chip, right? We, we have in, in, let's say, Recent, recent Apple devices or Android devices, there's um, basically a single chip that stores everything. It stores, it, it, has, it has RAM in it, it has um, CPU, it has arithmetical, uh, arithmetic logical unit inside the CPU, graphic processing unit, and so on, and even more. Uh, but back in the day, uh, at the beginning, let's say 30 years ago, um, when uh, 486, uh, was, was a popular CPU. Um, it, it did already, of course, combine these two physically in one unit, but those are two separate things, and it's important to understand when we're gonna take a look at machine code. Um, so control unit is responsible for controlling the execution of the code. Um, we can, if we'll take a look back at the theoretical steering machine, you can think of control unit as a motor rolling the tape one way or another and deciding uh, where to roll the tape. Arithmetic logic unit is the one that actually does the computations. Let's say it, it multiplies numbers or, or does some other mathematical or logical comparisons that you are looking for. Um, so that's a <coughs> that there. Uh, we have input and output, of course, uh, to be able to easily use our, use our machine. Um, 
I'll, I'll stress this. I kind of mentioned it in passing, but most modern systems use it. So it's uh, it, it's everywhere. And of course, we have we have these devices to be uh, to be able to easily work with our closed system to get data in and get data out. Um, what's important about von Neumann architecture is a joint memory unit. That means just in the classical Turing machine, we have just one memory. And it is finite, but it is a single strip. It starts from zero, the physical memory, and it goes up to however bytes you have, or however bits you have in your operating memory. And it is a single unit. And all, all your code and all your data is mixed together inside those memory banks. So that's an important concept. Well, of course, we also have Harvard architecture, which is not that common, but still we can find it, uh, we can buy it, we can buy devices using Harvard architecture on the internet right now. Um, digital signal processors, for example, uh, use it. Some microcontrollers also use it. Well, the, the, main, uh, the main difference you're gonna uh, see here is that instruction memory and data memory are separate. Also control unit and, and arithmetic logical unit is also often, um, often uh, more divided than we see in von Neumann architecture, but instruction memory and data memory is separate. Um, it actually has many benefits. So why do we see von Neumann architecture more on the market than we see Harvard architecture? Well, for Newman was easier to implement. Uh, for Harvard architecture, we, we have to have separate memory banks. It does have um, quite some benefits. So we can, we, the memories can have different attributes. For example, instruction memory can be organized differently. If all our instructions are the same size, uh, we can optimize it for, for speed. Speaking of speed, we do not have to wait on the same memory uh, to read both the instruction and data, yes. So does it mean then that uh, Harvard architecture is not vulnerable to meltdown and Spectre? Oh, good question. Um, no, uh, I would say I would say it can still be vulnerable uh, in theory. I haven't I haven't read any papers on if the actual bugs you mentioned are there in the wild for any hardware architectural systems, uh, hardware architecture systems. Um, but uh, the bugs you mentioned they they talk about um, speculative execution and control unit accessing. Uh, accessing uh, the data memory. Yeah, it's not about it's not about mixing up instructions with data. So okay. this design feature wouldn't wouldn't limit that. But if it's actually available in the wild, I wouldn't I wouldn't be able to tell. We'd have to take a look at research. Right. So um, these are separate, and it's quite important for the speed. So speed-wise, the improvement of speed comes from control unit not needing to wait um, to read first an instruction and then data from the same memory, right? Here, control unit, uh, well, let's say, let, let's say CPU altogether would need to read instruction and then it would only be able to understand what data to read and then read again from memory. Here, it can, be, it can happen at the same time. So it can read the instruction and data can already be read from different memory bus at the same time. Um, and again, it's being used, but we are gonna focus um, here on uh, von Neumann architectures. Now, machine code. Definition of a, a machine code that I came up with is a list of machine language instructions uh, that are to be directly executed by a CPU. So, for now, those of you who haven't heard these terms, let's just imagine there's a, this thing, and machine code is a list of these things, these, these commands, let's call them commands, uh, that will be executed. And each instruction is a small specific task. To, um, it, it tasks the CPU to perform something. It can perform data operation. Um, let's say it can say, it, it can ask, please load a value from memory address four million something something into register number three and store it there. That would be a data operation. It can perform some arithmetic and logic operations. For example, Please multiply, multiply register 2 by register 3 and store the result in register 2 or logic operations. Um, please check if register 2 is 0 or not and uh, depending on that, execute control flow operation. And control flow operations are, is, is that motor of, of the Turing machine that, that moves the execution pointer, the program counter to a different place. Uh, so it might say, okay, now, now you have to move 100 instructions forward and proceed from there. 
Um, and there are different instruction set architectures. Um, so here are, here are some more popular examples and one here just the fourth one out of respect. Um, and uh, what's different about those is the description. All of these are still full Turing machines, but they have different sets of instructions available. Uh, let's take a look at the, what the instruction is, for those of you who haven't heard the term before. Um, here, is, uh, here is a nice example from Wikipedia. Um, this, an, this is an example of MIPS, 32-bit instruction for add immediate value. So this is, this is how it would look, look in the memory, right? We can rewrite this as uh, three bytes, I think and store in memory, and the processor would execute it. Uh, instructions usually start, but always include an opcode, operations code. Um, and opcode is what actually defines what kind of operation processor should be doing. This, for example, is operation add immediate, and this table that maps um, these first bits with a specific instruction, and the format that's gonna follow is this instructions that architecture, right? So this is an example for MIPS32, one of the Opcodes. Right, we have two addresses, so uh, here uh, the command would be take this value of 350, uh, add it to one of the addresses and store the result in other, in, in a different register address. So that would be, that would be the command. Um, we're going to be taking a look at some simple but still uh, practical reverse engineering in the second part of this presentation, so please make sure you understand this. If, if not, please ask now. Keep silence forever. <laughs> okay. So, for um, to give you an overview, uh, here is um, here's a table of um, opcodes for x86 or 8086 architecture. Um, so, it's readable uh, from from uh, left to right, I would say. So, for example, um, nine zero is NOP. So, nine zero is a NOP instruction. Um, just, just to keep, keep check with you and make sure that how deep I'm going here, how many of you know what a NOP instruction is? Damn, that's not 7%. That's like, <laughs> I'd say one third of you here uh, are, are, could maybe not, not, not teach me but compete with me at, at, at reverse engineering for sure. Uh, this is a beginner's uh, basics, basic things. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, uh, right. Uh, since I asked the question, even though it's not relevant here, uh, NOP instruction basically says the CPU to do nothing. So one cycle is spent just doing nothing, just, just waiting along. Great for, great for hackers, for people who try to uh, make, make your code execute, um, execute their instructions for an op slide. Um, okay, so uh, we, we, we have also some color coding here. For example, uh, mathematical operations are, are, are here in, in green. We have uh, control operations here in uh, checkered blue, and so on. So, and, and that's enough. I think, uh, I think unless, uh, as far as we're talking about, uh, about stuff that doesn't involve input and output, uh, there was a paper written um, two years or one year ago that basically describes how a single opcode can be used as a full Turing machine. Um, so that's that's quite quite exciting. If you're into that things, that type of things, you can you can look it up. Uh, right before we before we finish with the last theoretical slide, uh, a small note on virtual address address space. And this is important if you're gonna if you're gonna be going deeper into into, into reverse engineering, right? So addresses addresses are are. Um, sectors, pages, places on that infinite tape or, or finite tape in case of a real machine, uh, right? So each, uh, each address contains, um, contains uh, some data. Um, for modern operating systems um, like uh, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, virtual address space is used. Each process gets uh, in 32-bit system um, four gigabytes of virtual address space that is somehow mapped into your physical, uh, physical RAM or, or SVAP, if you don't have enough RAM, on your machine. And this is what process sees. So process actually um, has these addresses. And the good thing about virtual address space is, is that each time you launch a specific process, let's say calculator on your Windows machine, 
um, everything is going to be in the same in the same place. The entry point of your program is going to be in the same place. Uh, your 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 data is going to be in the same place. Your functions are going to be in the same place. So it's it actually allows the compiler to create a code that knows where to jump, where to, where to go in, 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 this, in this area there. Um, well, that was before um, address space layers randomization, which kind of screws things up a bit, especially for attackers. Um, major operating systems adopted this, this defense mechanism, uh, I'd say, majorly adopted around 2015, 2014, so it's, it's, it's not that new, uh, it's not that old in practice. Um, but it basically means that every time you launch a program, all these addresses are randomized up a bit, uh, which makes it harder for an attacker. But this is a basic score, so we aren't, we aren't going to deal with the SLR, actually. Um, so, the final, final slide of, of the theory, uh, stack and, and, and heap. So, as programmers who, who make programs, you of course know that you have variables, right? And those variables have to go somewhere. Well, um, they can't be really part of the program code because unless you want to actually modify uh, your program code on the fly, create a polymorphic program, um, those have to be stored somewhere separately. Now, this is how, um, how your um, program would look in virtual address space. Of course, it also has address to access to kernel functions. Uh, it can jump into, into libraries and so on. But for your, your own program, you have code segment, you have a data segment, where you have, uh, let's say, some static strings, most, most likely, some constants maybe. And then on top of that, you have heap and stack. And they grow in, they, they, they grow in opposite direction. There is this division, theoretical division between stack and heap, uh, heap is used for dynamic allocation, it allows random access, and stack is uh, used for, for uh, static memory allocation. So, for example, if you know the structure of your, of your um, variable and you can predict specific size, you can, uh, you can, you can put it on, on, on stack if you wish. Uh, but, uh, so, so, one funny thing, or, or rather dangerous thing that happens here is you can actually use stack to, to overwrite heap or, or vice versa, uh, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a basic thing. As an attacker, I mean, you can, you can do that. See, if it grows over here and heap grows over there, at one point it will clash, and you can actually, if you control one part and not the other part, you can make, you, you can overwrite other variables in your program. Now you can use a bunch of other attacks. But it's not about attacks today. Um, it's about reverse engineering. And to take a look at that, let's, um, first try to quickly engineer something. Um, let's create a program binary. Now, how many of you in the past year have, have worked uh, with a compiler, IDE, or something, something like that, so outside of web, in addition to web? Okay, okay, uh, two thirds, three, three fourths. Um, well, it does a lot of things for you. Of course, uh, of course, IDE also does debugging and assists you typing, uh, typing the correct function names, the correct order of parameters. But when you actually try to run the program, it does a lot of things in the background. And we're going to try to break those things down. It's not just compiling. There are multiple steps involved there. Um, so there's compilation step, there's assembler step, and then there's linker. And just in case, uh, just in case we'd like to we'd like to link um, multiple, multiple so source files um, together. So let's, uh, let's take a look. Um, I think these slides are also mixed up, sorry. Uh, I should have started with this one. So uh, <laughs> we have human readable source code. In this case, it's a language called C. Um, what compiler does, compiler compiles this human readable source code into human readable assembly code. Okay, now I'm, I'm really afraid to ask this question, but, but how many of you have written assembly? So it's like... <laughs> did, you, did you tell them it's, it's a basics course? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's like older human readable <laughs> assembler code. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Are you sure GCC still does that? Well, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, uh, compiler creates a human readable uh, assembly, 
And assembler actually takes this human readable assembly and creates binary object code, or basically uh, relocatable machine code. Relocatable meaning that it can be easily placed in any place needed in, in the memory here, depending on what you add to your program and how you compile what libraries you add to them. And that's where, where linkers comes in. It links it with all, all the libraries, all other parts of your source code, and actually creates a directly executable machine code. So let's take a look and try to answer your question there. <laughs> no, it will do something different. It will do it all the steps together. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, right, that screen's over there. <laughs> okay. Is the font good enough, or do you need larger? Uh, raise hands, you guys. Who needs larger font? Okay. Okay. We, we have some space on the screen, luckily. Um. Is that good enough? Uh, raise hands to still this. <laughs> okay, good. Okay. I think I'm gonna move this uh, move this away somewhere else so that we have more screen space. Um. Okay, so we have that. Um, right, let's write a small C program. Let's use a, let's not start battle of Vim or Emacs, let's use a nano. So this, this looks like a C program. It should, should work, I think. Um, so what it does, well, everyone knows assembler here, so you probably know C, C as well. By the way, I, I really need that programmer for a small project if, if, someone, <laughs> if someone's looking for a job. Um, so um, what it does is it basically returns 32 as exit status to the system, right? Um, if we can compile it um, using minus S, what does minus s do? So minus s is that magical switch that actually allows this to happen. Um, it it creates a assembly file. Without okay. minus s, it would go directly to to the okay. executable program. When you're compiling normally, it probably doesn't generate the human readable source. Probably, probably. Um, okay, let's take a look at the file now. So this is this is how it looks. Um, can we make it bigger? Yes. So human can read actually. Oh, so it has, yeah, human readable, right? Um, is it okay? No. A bit bigger, fifteen maybe. Yeah. Okay. It's all good uh, on, on the last one, right? Good, good. Right. So um, it has uh, it has a lot of shortcuts here, uh, starting with a with a dot. But if you look at the actual commands, we have a push command here, a move command, uh, one more move command, and pop and return. So basically, nothing much. So here is uh, here is the thirty two. It's being moved into register extended a AX, and then we have return that actually returns it back to the system. Um, now, let's, uh, let's go forward and create the relocatable code. Um, What is that type wrong? Increase the file. Hmm. 
Yeah, interesting. Maybe somebody from the audience can debug. Yeah, we have, uh, like most of you have done assembly. Hmm. I don't know if it's the extension, it shouldn't be probably. Let's try to name it as, as it should. Ah, it's an extension, ah, okay. Right, uh, so now now we have our object file. Uh, sorry, me? Sorry if you use us. Oh, yeah. Uh, then again, Linux never never cares about extensions, usually. Um, so we have the object file here. If we take a look at it, it's probably not going to open in, in this uh, text editor. If you use nano, it's going to be a bunch of junk. Um, so you see it's, it's, already, it's already L format. So if we take a look at the files here, we have the C source. We have the assembler source and we have the elf, uh, elf reallocatable. And we wouldn't be able to run it. Well, first of all, because it's not executable, <coughs> but that's easily fixed. Um, but it doesn't have the necessary properties, including it's not mapped into specific memory locations. So um, the remaining step is, of course, we take it and we compile it into an executable file here. So now if you take a look at them, here's what we have. Uh, and this is actually executable that is linked dynamically in this case and can actually be used. Um, for reverse engineering, one more aspect that we also take a look at is um, if the file is stripped or not. Um, Just to make sure, can we maybe run it so, so everybody knows that, okay, yes. run it and it's 32. Yes. So. Um, the return value in bash can be uh, can be can be uh, extracted using this um, this variable. So we have zero right now, which means it's uh, the last command exit normally. If we run if we run this testing, nothing happens. But if we take a look at this exit value, we see that the exit value is 32. Right. Um, so the stripped part. So one more, one more try. How many of you know what stripping is and what's the difference between a stripped vari variable and not stripped variable? Finally, only only five hands. Yes. <laughs> okay. So stripping removes symbols um, from from an executable, uh, and we will take a look at how that impacts our work as reverse engineer uh, in 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 the final part of the presentation. Uh, I want to strip it. We we can create a copy of it um, just so we can compare them. Now they're the same. Right? If we strip one of them, we see that they are different. We, we get different different hash sums here. Um, and it's also it's also smaller, which is which is one of the reasons why developers strip um, executables. But once again, if you use IDE, it may be so that all of this happens magically at the press at the press of a button. Well, stripped programs are harder to debug. Um, so we're going to get back to this after one more slide. <coughs> so here is the full cycle of engineering and reverse engineering um, of a piece of software. Engineers usually usually start from concepts, requirements, they create the design on paper, and then they create a source code with comments, right? Uh, and it's, it, gets, it gets compiled either to machine code directly or to assembly language and then to machine code. Um, and then user can execute. Now, and and this, is, this is a full cycle. And well, sometimes, sometimes some developers started source code. They just, you know, they have this great idea and they do what's called prototyping and they write this quick quick piece of software without thinking much and just, just see how it works. But for large projects, we usually start, uh, start at concepts or at least requirements. Now for reverse engineer, of course, we start at uh, machine code. If you, if you steal source code with comments, it's not reverse engineering, even though it can be fun too, but mostly highly illegal. Um, so starting in machine code, um, reverse engineers can use a disassembler to go to assembly language. And if you can read assembly, and almost half you can, apparently, um, that's great. You can use this, um, this assembler. It will always work. It will always produce a result if the program is obfuscated, meaning machine code is created in such a manner 
that it is hard to read intentionally, uh, well, then, even though you will be able to read the actual instructions, you will not be able to easily make sense of what the program um, does. Well, next step is uh, decompiler, trying to get to source code. Uh, still, comments will be probably gone. Um, can someone here name a language where comments are usually left inside after compilation? Who cares about comments if you have uh, function names? Variable names. Yeah, that's good, yes. F function names, yeah? These ones can you decompile? Function names help a lot. Function names help a lot, and, and if it's not stripped, then you, then you do get, uh, do get your, your object names, yes. Uh, but there are, there are languages that, uh, that also, also allow you to, uh, to, to, to see the comments. Um, so, and then you're here, and most, most reverse engineers don't usually go back there. Uh, by the way, if you, if you take a look at this phase, this phase here, the first three and a half boxes, that is the first slide, right? This also applies to reverse engineering actual physical products. And it also applies to um, software. But most reverse engineers would stop here, unless you want to do what's called a white room implementation. Let's say you have uh, European, European and I think American copyright law allows us to do that. For example, you have, um, you have Microsoft Word, the old one, Word 97, that, that has this great format called doc, where you can write Word documents. And now you want to have an open source software that also reads that format. But you have no documentation on how that format works. So what you do is you reverse engineer the machine code and the file examples of the actual Microsoft Word processor. You go to your source code, you write comments by hand if you need to, uh, but you cannot use that source code to create an open source software. It wouldn't be legal. It would not be legal. So what you do, you go a step back. You go to design and you stay usually here. And then you have the design description, you have the overall design document, and then you give it to someone else who was not involved in, in, in the reverse engineering process. That's what's called uh, uh, white room or clean room uh, re-implementation of a product. They just look at your specification and they write code from scratch without ever seeing any parts of the machine code or the disassembled code of the original product. So to recap, you, you managed to reverse engineer it down to source code, then managed to derive the design and specification from that source, source code, then you hand over to another team and then they, they implement it their own way. Yeah, that's correct. And that, that, that's what's, what has been done uh, in the in the 90s, with with many commercial commercial products. These days, uh, these days, most of the software that's used by an average user is actually they, they embrace uh, the necessity for standards to be open, and it's not needed so much. But still, some specialty software like CAD software, for example, computer assisted design, um, they they use closed file formats. You haven't men mentioned which language uh, puts uh, comments into the binary. Yes, I forgot. Language is. I forgot the language, but. <laughs> yeah, it it it, it isn't. Yes, yes. <laughs> I'll try to I'll try to remember. If I do, I'll I'll let you know. Um, okay, so the fun, the fun part. Let's take a look at some some demos. Sorry for seven or or fifty percent of you who do that every day. Uh, let's take a look at, uh, at some, some reverse engineering. So, um, here in this demo we'll take a C program that's been compiled and uh, try to do static reverse engineering on it with some tools. Let me, mm -hmm, let me link, oh man. So. Okay. So we have this uh, program compiled here. 
let's say attacker has just the binary, right? Let's take a look at uh, stripped one first, right? So what, what happened here actually copied the password binary and stripped it um, of its symbols. It can still work perfectly. So it asks you to enter the password, right? You enter the password and then it says if the password is correct or not. Basically, that's all it does, right? And just to check the return value, it doesn't return anything, at least in this case. So the simplest thing that the reverse engineer can do is use strings, or there's actually an alternate to strings, especially designed for reverse engineers. Um, so you can use strings and the binary name. What strings does is it extracts printable characters printable sequential characters of a specific length. By default, I think it's five. So it will open this up um, in binary mode, like this, and it will take a look at all the characters in the program, looking for at least five sequential printable characters, and it will print it on your screen. Right, so that's what it does. If we scroll back up, here it is. The first, the first one is the one that we found, right? If you need different lengths, you can just if you get too much, too much junk on the screen, you can you can specify you specify longer length. Oh, wrong command. You can specify longer length, like this, right? And then you, then you see only those strings that are at least twelve characters or more. Um, so, well, we see the strings here, right? So this, if we were tasked with finding the string that appears when the password is correct, we found it, probably, maybe. Maybe the developer is screwing with us, but probably we found it. Um, well, if we, if we tune this back down to five, we can try to locate the password too. So we, can, we, could, we could probably safely assume that this may be a password at least worth a try, right? So we could, uh, we could launch our our program, type it in, and it sees that it actually works. So easy as that, right? Um, one more thing we can do, we can actually use a proper disassembler for that. So this was easy because the password was not encoded in any way um, in there. If it were, we wouldn't be able to find it. So even if it was XORed using a super simple um, encryption scheme. We can use Radar Framework, for example, to um, take a look at the, um, at the binary. Now, if we print the disassembly of, a func of the function main, it automatically tries to find the entry point and So you try to find it. Uh, we can actually see the assembly code here. If we compile assembly of this C program, which attacker cannot do, obviously, the reverse engineer cannot do, but we can since we have it here. Um, we can take a look. We can take a look at it. Oops. Now this is. Uh, so the data here, here's the actual code. We can see external functions being called, like printf, for example, for print, or str string compare for string comparison, right? Um, and we see that it should match with the code that we get here. So we see the push here, we see the uh, move here, we see the sub, and so on, it's all here. Uh, now 80 is 50, of course, depending on the encoding um, numbering scheme. Right, so as an attacker, as a reverse engineer, you can see what's happening here. You can see different operations, and you can see uh, calls to system functions. Scanning means reading from keyboard, and comparison here. So whatever is was scanned there is being compared to string um, that is denoted by this pseudo address and is visible down below over there. So that's just one of the, one of the things that Radar Framework could do. It's, it's a very powerful one and it's being developed 
uh, quite a lot. If you're interested in that, and I see that many of you are interested in, in either assembly or reverse engineering, there is Radar conference every year in September. Dates already been set uh, for this year, so you can look it up and go and, and have, some, have some fun. Um, right, um, let's move forward then. Um, let's look at Android APK. So an Android application, how can we do static analysis of, of that? It's a completely different one, um, obviously. Well, we can use universal tool like Binwalk or a specific tool like uh, JD, GU, uh, J JD GUI. Let me close this down. So you have the file here, APK. We can do binwalk and the file name. This is one of the governmental applications in, in Latvia, one of the first versions. Uh, we did reverse engineering on it and found that uh, user database is available to everybody, including passwords. Uh, application is used for snitching on other people, like when they park in, in the wrong place, and you can get all that out of there. Um, so Binwalk, uh, it just looks, looks into what you, what, what you have there and, uh, and, and, and prints a list. If we want to extract everything, you can use minus E and extract everything. And what happens is we get this folder here. Just to, just to comprehend it, so Latvian government released an application for citizens to snitch on other citizens who, who violate parking laws. Not specifically parking laws, but municipality laws. Like drinking yeah, in public, yeah, but, loud noise. Okay, so the motivation then would be that, okay, you have... Uh, it violates your personal freedom, and then instead, instead of like calling police explicitly, you you just snitch on, on the You just use the application, yeah, like, okay. you know. Okay, like instead of, so 911. No, no, I mean, it, uh, people people do call a lot, uh, and, and I myself, if I can't, if I can't get out, uh, out of uh, my garage because someone's parked there, I also call the police. So it's easier to use the app, you know, you have the pictures and everything, and... But how, how reactive it is in comparison to the public police? Oh, it's, they, it's, it's like an emergency service. Not officially, uh, maybe, but yeah, 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 it's live. Okay, they they re yeah. re react very Yeah, yeah, here's, here's the logo, by the way. So, um, so yeah. Um, in this case... Uh, you don't have to speak with anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you don't like to yeah. speak to people. In this case, uh, APK is, is obviously, obviously an archive, uh, which means you can also, also open this up using... Um, Using just a zip tool, um, but in more complex scenarios, this will this will pr produce similar result with you being able to access many of the files. So what would this be in, in walk? Because uh, obviously APK you can just unzip it. But yes. In walk will it extract files from other formats? Uh, yes. Bin walk. The idea of bin walk behind bin walk is it walks through the binary and looks for uh, headers or footers or or or. Uh, no. Exactly, signatures, basically for file signatures, and extracts them, yeah. Um, so, but that way we can get some, uh, you know, we, we can get some images, maybe sometimes configuration, we, can, we get XML files using, uh, uh, we, we get XML files with some private keys sometimes, so that's, that's also fun. Um, but uh, what, we, what we are looking for is uh, source code, right? And, uh, well, this is how, how it works. Um, let me remove, let me move this one away. Already did this previously. Oh, come on. Oh, what's happening there? Okay, now. Oh, I moved them all. <laughs> right. Right, so we have this APK file. So what we can do is we can convert it to jar first. Um, there is a handy um, open source utility called dex to jar And we specify the file we want to convert. It does this magic, converts it to jar file, which can then be opened um, using JD GUI, for example, and uh, easily viewed. So the source can be viewed that way. So now we're going to launch JD GUI. So 
So here it is. And we move the jar file in and it, it opens up. We see the classes, we see, I don't know if I can zoom it, I, can, I probably cannot zoom it, zoom it but we, we see the actual application here and we can see different fragments like adding photo, constants here, also sometimes contains some secret keys, some, some API endpoints. Uh, so it wasn't even obfuscated? No, no, I mean, why would it? It, it, it wasn't even secure, why would it be obfuscated? Uh, <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, you can, you can get a lot of stuff here, right? Source code. Um, right, so, well, I still have two, two demos, is it okay? Yeah, good. <clears throat> so, then, um, binary debugging. Static analysis means that we don't actually execute any of the code um, on a machine. We execute in our head, uh, we process it ourselves. We can also do live debugging. Mm, so, <clears throat> let's take a look. I have this small application here. It's very similar to the one we wrote. Right? Um, it basically returns 42. Um, and uh, let's say we want to launch it and execute it step by step. Now for a small application like this, it doesn't really make sense because if we disassemble it, uh, we, get, uh, we get something similar to, oh, I, I haven't, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, let's jump, let's, let's jump to this one, sorry. So, different application, math. If we launch that, that's what it does, right? We type in one number, we type in the second number, and we get the result. Ta -da. If we type in a larger number, another larger number, oh man, at one point we probably get a wrong. Is it wrong? I don't know, probably. It looks, it looks wrong. So we get um, integer overflows, we get into negatives, and, and then back to positives, and anyway, it's a super simple program um, in this case. Now, what I wanted for you to see as developers is uh, how an attacker, how a reverse engineer will see your code. So in this case, um, you've, written, you've written this code here, right? Quite, uh, well, this, this probably isn't vulnerable, but if, if, if those were strings, then it would. Um, oh yeah, the, the password program, by the way. That was super vulnerable, but I'm gonna back, get back to that in a minute. So, that's your source code. Um, that's your binary file. Bunch of garbage, some symbols. Um, attacker that wants to disassemble your code gets this. So you, you have the actual function, system function names here. So it is quite readable. And if we compare it to, uh, to the assembly that you made as a developer, it's even a bit more readable because this assembler adds, uh, adds some comments that actually uh, map these strings here to the place that they're used. Um, now, if your reverse engineer has access to the compiler, not only the assembler, not only the assembler, this is what they get. If I open it side by side with your source code, well, it's not side by side. So it's quite similar. We have our integers, um, we have puts, we have printf. For some reason, it adds uh, the parameter here. That's what the compiler did. It has scan that scans an integer into v5, v6. It has v7 is v5 plus v6, which is here, right? And then, funny enough, compiler decided to optimize it this way that it sums it again here uh, instead of using v7. Uh, but uh, there we have it. So it's quite, it's even more readable for, for reverse engineer, right? Using uh, the compiler initial to this assembler. 
Mm, one quick thing I wanted to show about this password program, by the way. Remember, this is the one we had here. If the character count is limited, so unless we use protection, which compiler provides, um, if we enter more than 64 characters, we can, of course, um, smash the stack. I didn't want to press that. In this case, compiler provided protection, but if it wouldn't have, we would have overwritten uh, the stack, meaning we could get code execution potentially in the future. Uh, now this 42 program, real quick, if we launch it with debugger, like this, we load it using GDB, we can uh, set a breakpoint, meaning that break execution at one point, main, function main, default function, it works if it's not stripped. And then we can start the execution, it reaches the breakpoint, break and we can take a look at where we are. So these are registers, uh, here's our instruction pointer, this is where we're at, and we can, um, for example, show instruction at the program counter, see that's the push, push instruction. These are all our instructions, here's 2A, which is hex for 42, and uh, that's basically that's basically return, that's, that's the program, and now we're out, outside of main, it's a super short program. And we can go step by step, instruction by instruction, um, and debug it and take a look at the registers every time, and take a look at memory and debug it that way. Um, now, the final, final short demo is a real life example that I spent a lot of last year on, well, not, not creating this example, but on uh, reverse engineering microotic uh, routers. Some of you may have seen um, my talks on, on that one. If not, you can, you can check, check, it out, check them out on kudos.org. Now, in this example, I have a file from a developer, uh, from a vendor. It's an upgrade file for a system. So it's some custom format. It's not recognizable by, by standard GNU tools. Um, so for custom formats, we do have to rely on the community or we do have to work a lot to actually be able to um, recover the data. In this case, there's an app, specific app for MicroTik called UnNPK that allows us to open up these packages. So we extract the file called systemNPK and it gets extracted right here. So we, we see some folders already, some files, and we can start working with them, but nothing much. We have uh, Bash, Milo, so, and we can then reverse engineer these programs. Uh, we have SquashFS here, so we can use unsquashfs to this system SquashFS. Um, unsquashfs is, is a generic tool that allows us to open up these file systems. And what we see there is SquashFS <coughs> root, which actually contains all the, all the specific binaries of of, of the vendor, right? And then we can disassemble those for the run using GDB or strings as we, as we saw, right? So we can do strings, um, what would be interesting here, ping wouldn't be one probably, loader, I don't know. And we can take a look at, at some strings. This way we can also find uh, the secret they use to encode the password, for example, in this case. So um, yeah, we can combine that to be able to actually reverse engineer actual large products. Uh, now, if you want to take, uh, slides will be available, but if you want to, if you want to take a, uh, a look at some tools that I use, and, and I can recommend these are some of those. We have both uh, Linux tools, uh, tools usable on Linux, tools usable on Windows, uh, O-Tool for, for Mac OS. You haven't mentioned why, why did you laugh when you reverse engineered this firmware. I laughed? Yeah, yeah, you said that you were laughing where I heard it from me. Mm, maybe, 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 yeah, maybe I misspoke. Uh, I, I just said that I spent uh, spent the last uh, last year working with, with with looking at their vulnerabilities, just uh, just to find if there are any, and there are are some, and uh, that that turned out uh, that turned up fixing a lot of them, uh, which is, which is good. Yeah, but. Uh, the funny part was that they actually have this secret, had this secret as a string in there that is used to encode, encrypt the password uh, for the users, which means as soon as attackers get access to the data files, they can reverse engineer a password for, for each of the cases. They finally fixed it uh, last month, so, so that's cool. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Kira.
unfortunately we don't have uh, question, uh, t enough time for question answer session. Uh, let's have a short break uh, of 15 or 20 minutes and then get back uh, to, the, to the second talk. Thank you, Kirill, for, for presenting to us.